Good evening and a very warm welcome to everyone who is joining us this evening, joining the National Holocaust Centre and Museum for the first in our series of live events to mark Holocaust Memorial Day 2021. And we're privileged this evening to be joined by two very special guests who I will introduce in a moment to explore this year's theme, to be the light in the darkness. And we will be exploring the theme of hope in the darkness of the Holocaust by looking at extremely powerful and poignant paintings. To introduce our two special guests this evening, we are extremely privileged to be joined by Eva Schloss, MBA, Eva is a Holocaust survivor, memoirist, and the stepdaughter of Otto Frank. Born in Vienna, her family emigrated after the Nazi annexation of Austria, first to Belgium and then to Holland. In 1942, they went into hiding in Amsterdam, but two years later were betrayed by a double agent in the resistance and deported to Auschwitz. Eva has published three books about her experiences and was co-founder of the Anne Frank Trust UK. Eva was an awarded an MBA in 2011 for her incredible work in the field of Holocaust education. Good evening, Eva. How are you? Fine, thank you. Good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, Eva. Thank you. And I know just before we came on air, you were talking about having so many speaking commitments this week. So thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you. Thank you for asking me for today. <clears throat> thank you. And we are also so pleased to be joined by Lisbeth van der Hurst. Lisbeth is the director of the Resistance Museum in Amsterdam. The museum was founded in 1984 to preserve the memory of the resistance against national socialism and fascism. In 2013, the museum opened a dedicated exhibit, Resistance Museum Junior, which tells the true stories of four children during the Nazi occupation of Holland. And one of these children is Eva. Lisbeth, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you for inviting me. I'm glad to be thank here. You. Thank you. Thank you. And what's especially lovely is, Lisbeth, obviously you're joining us this evening after an introduction from Eva, who obviously praise the incredible work that your museum does and said that we just absolutely had to speak to you uh, and it's from that introduction that obviously you're joining us this evening so thank you so much thank you Eva <laughs> well it's a pleasure <laughs> because um about 10 years ago is or perhaps longer I donated the original paintings which Heinz and my father created in hiding, I donated them to the Resistance Museum. So this was really a very important step for me and for the museum, I think. Absolutely. And that really special relationship, obviously, we're going to have some time just to, to explore this evening. Um, and Eva, if, if it's OK, we're going to start with you. And obviously... The 27th of January, which is, is approaching now, obviously marks the anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz. And I wondered, please, if you might be able to start by just sharing a little of your experience of liberation and those final days at Auschwitz prior to liberation. Um, yes, this was, of course, an amazing luck for us that the Russians were already advancing. Because in the West, unfortunately, people were liberated much, much later. But in January, the Russian advanced into Poland and 
of course, liberated many concentration camps, and one of them was Auschwitz. Um, we inmates were in a terrible, terrible condition. It was freezing cold. The snow was probably over a meter high. Very often we walked without shoes. Very often we had practically no clothes on. We had no food. Um, the Nazis um, knew the Russians. We didn't know the Russians were near. We had no idea. But the Nazis knew. And so they started to evacuate the camp. Every day, many barracks were emptied and people disappeared. We didn't know where they killed, what happened to them. And one night, um, it must have been, of course, we didn't, we didn't even know it was January. We only knew it was winter. Let's say perhaps it was um, 20th of January. Um, the Nazis said, everybody has to get out of their barracks at night. We are all going to march um, into Germany. Well, you can imagine nearly skeleton people. How can they go and march um, uh, in the snow without food, with it practically cold? So my mother and me, my mother was very, very weak, said, well, I can't go, I can't go. But then the Nazis said, we are going to lock up the barracks that were wooden and burn the whole camp down. So out everybody. So then my mother and me stood out as well. So that in the night there were air raids because the Russians flew over the area and the Germans didn't want to march in an air raid. So they sent us back again. And that went on the whole night. And eventually my mother said, look, I just can't go. I'd rather die here than starting to go out again. So we stayed. We were deep asleep. We didn't hear what was going on because we were exhausted and it was light and we realized the camp was emptied. But nevertheless, there were about 500 people left in Birkenau still. And we were about 10 days on our own where many people perished and we didn't back, we couldn't bury them. I was still of the few ones who had the strength to carry the bodies out. We just heaped them out outside the barrack in the snow. And remember, this was for me, I think, in the whole experience, one of the worst things to carry those people who had spoken the day before out and just drop them in the snow. And then the Russians arrived. Um, one day at the gate, many, many soldiers came with horses, with uh, jeeps, with fi and a field kitchen. And they fed us, they gave us food, hot food, cabbage soup. Um, it was wonderful. We ate, we ate, and they, the Polish people could talk to them. They say, don't worry, we are going to look after you. But the next day they had left, and we were left again on our own. So eventually I decided I would go to Auschwitz, it was Birkenau, the women's camp, to try to find my father and brother. So one night I did because I was fighting, bullets were flying around all the time. And um, I did that and I came to Auschwitz where the Russians had made their headquarters and I went to all the barracks and looked everywhere. I saw many, many very, very near to death people. And I came to somebody and he looked familiar. And I said, I think I know you. And he said, yes, I'm Otto Frank, Anne's father. And you are Eva Geiringer, Anne's friend. I said, yes, yes. Have you seen my girls? Have you seen my wife? No, I never saw them. But he had seen my father and brother. They said, oh, they went with the Nazis. So, they were still alive. Perhaps the war will end really soon. I had great hope. I went back to fetch my mother and um, we settled them in Auschwitz. And then later the Russians transported us eastward because of course the war was not finished. That is just a little bit of that story. Thank you so much, Eva. And so, did you did you have that sense of 
of kindness in some way then from from the Russian soldiers, do you think? Well, you know, we couldn't really speak with them. Um, it was it was a very, very difficult situation. But mm -hmm. the Russian soldiers, obviously, they had orders to not leave us in Auschwitz. And so we traveled eastward. We traveled till May eastward, till we ended up in Odessa. That's another long story, of course. And in Odessa, we waited for the end of the war, which came in May. And then really we knew we had made it. Thank you, Eva. And, and eventually, obviously, you, you returned to Amsterdam and you later learned that your father and brother had died at Mauthausen. And you remembered later a conversation that you had had with Heinz during the deportation to Auschwitz, where he had spoken to you about some paintings. And I wonder if you could tell us a little about that, about the paintings and the decision that you made to, to go to try to find those. Um, in the cattle truck, when we were betrayed and sent them to Auschwitz, um, the last conversation more or less I had with my brother was he told me that before they were arrested, um, before they, when the paintings were finished, they hid them under the floorboard of the house where they were hiding with a note on it. This belongs to Heinz and Eric Geiringer. And after the war, we are going to pick it up again. And Heinz told me, if I am not making it, Eva, please, go and pick, and you are, please go and pick the paintings up because they are really very, very precious to me. So, and of course he didn't make it. And then when we heard that my father and he hadn't survived, I said to my mother, we have to go and get the pictures. But we were a bit reluctant because this woman where the pictures were hidden, that was a fault that we were all arrested. That was her fault. So I didn't really want to confront her. But luckily, she had disappeared. And there were another couple living there who first didn't want us to let in. They didn't believe nothing is in our house hidden. But eventually, they let us do it. And I was amazed about the wonderful artwork which I found there. Absolutely. And Eva, can you just describe a little bit that, that moment of, of actually finding those paintings and, and starting to see what was there? It was, of course, a very emotional time to see all this, what has happened. And Heinz was a very studious, very intellectual young boy. And um, he was always surrounded by books and um, reading all the time, and but painting, of course, as well. And there is one painting, he's sitting at the desk, on top of the desk is a globe, and um, there's a calendar, and it, the date is 11th, and that was my birthday. So that was when he painted it, he was thinking of me. And that, of course, I found very, very moving, and in a way, very sad that he Absolutely. He wasn't Absolutely. Us anymore. And and like you say, to I imagine to see the painting and obviously to see your birthday and, and to know obviously that you were so much in his thoughts at that time. I can't imagine gentle brother, you know, he was always I was a girl, I was a wild one, and he was always the gentle one. And it it always seems as well, Eva, just um, for for yourself, just very much um, him as a source of um, admiration. And as you were having to make so many moves that you talk about him just being able to adapt and, and kind of um, ease into those new places and, and you almost look into him as, as the one who was able to do that. I still miss him every day, really. 
It is amazing. And he wrote as well beautiful poetry, um, which actually we have published as well in parts. Um, you know, and this is sometimes people ask me, um, does it feel a bit that sit time now that you can't go out, you can't do anything, you can't meet people? Does it feel similar? And young people get depressed. And this was Hans' way to occupy himself, to create things. And so he was very, very frightened of being arrested and, and frightened of being killed. Um, he kept himself so busy, so occupied, that he must have forgotten the danger he was in day in, day out. Absolutely. And like you say, Eva, to create such beautiful paintings. I know, obviously, we've, we've seen the first one um, and there's a, the picture, the painting of the tennis players as well. I don't know if you want to say a little bit about that. Well, he was longing, of course, to be outside again, to be in the fresh air, um, you know, and do games and do things like that. He missed this very, very much. He loved nature. and. Um, and all the paint, he was cooked up in a little room. He was not allowed to look out of the window. And nevertheless, he had these details in the painting. Very many uh, artists who looked at the paintings said this is done by somebody who is an expert. And, you know, he had never done any uh, oil painting. So it was amazing how he was able to create a very variety of um, subjects. He started off actually with still lives to try to get to know his um, velvet, glass, um, copper, um, all kind of different things. But then later, this is a later picture, he did landscapes and figures and all kind of different things and all just from imagination. Which is just absolutely incredible. And I think we're seeing the third of those um, paintings, Eva. The clock, again, I don't know if you want to say a little bit about this one. This is as well one of my favourites, and he explained it to me when, he, um, when we visited occasionally, um, because some pictures I had seen, he said, you see that little bird sitting on the windowsill? He can fly away any time he wants to, he'd be off. I wish, I, and there's a poem as well, um, little bird, where are you going? I wish I could follow you. And um, the time is, the bell, the time is running out. Thank you, Eva. That sense, like you say, of just longing for freedom. Um, and the, obviously the paintings are just beautiful. They're just incredible paintings. And I know that you said at the beginning, obviously making the decision to gift the paintings and, and other objects to the museum. And um, Lisbeth, I, I know that you're going to tell us a little bit about the work of the museum and the way that you work with Eva's story and with the paintings. Um, and I imagine just an absolutely incredible gift to receive, to be able to work with audiences with Eva's story and, and with those paintings. Yes, this is really an uh, extraordinary donation, uh, especially because it, the, the paintings are great, but there's also a lot of documents because, uh, well, um, uh, many objects uh, in Amsterdam were saved and it's quite uh, unusual. Most of the Jewish people lost everything, but uh, for from Eva, there was, there was a lot of uh, documents as well and photographs. So it was great to, to make an ex exhibition with it. Yeah, and a, a, and a very moving story. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and Elizabeth, it'd be really interesting just to hear a little bit more about the museum and about the work that you do. Um, I think it was really interesting when we were looking at the work you do, of, particularly with primary age students, which is an area of work, obviously, for ourselves as well at the centre. So it'd be, it'd be really interesting to hear a little bit more about your work. Yes, well, we, we, we have a, a, a permanent exhibition, big permanent exhibition, uh, which covers the unexpected choices and dilemmas of the Dutch population. And we focus on 
uh, the the different ways people dealt with the Nazi occupation. So we don't only tell the story about resistance, but also of collaboration, of accommodation, of looking away. Uh, we show all sides and uh, people uh, can identify uh, and it uh, it makes them uh, they're encouraged to reflect about it um, uh, well we receive over 100 uh, visitors each year from all over the world and uh, when uh, Eva donated this rich collection uh, we had already plans to extend the museum with a new part especially for children and uh, it is was realized in 2013 and uh, this is the Dutch Resistance Museum Junior and uh, a, a lot of uh, children's museum uh, use uh, fictional characters but we wanted to have real characters so uh, the Junior Museum uh, is about the Jewish Eva. It's about Hank, who family, whose family adapted to the circumstances, so just an average family. Uh, Jan, whose parents were in the resistance, and also Nelly, uh, who was a, a Dutch Nazi girl. She was uh, a convinced young uh, Nazi girl. And uh, we are telling their stories in a way that the young children can identify with all of them. And this makes them uh, think about right and wrong, uh, what can we do? And uh, it's, it's a, well, we, it's a quite uh, a successful layout. The children first start in a, a old fashioned elevator, which turns out to be a time machine and it flashes them back to the 1940s. And when they step out, they see a public square somewhere in the Netherlands with four houses. And in front of the four houses, uh, the four children introduce themselves in an animation in a, in a box. And they tell, well, this was my family like, and this, these are my hobbies, and these are my friends. And uh, then the children can go into the houses and um, discover their stories uh, in small story elements. And it's in sound, it's in animation, and uh, often it's, uh, um, it's hidden in, uh, in drawers and uh, 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 cupboards in, in period furniture. So it's really a, a different world where the, where the young, young children step into they, they see old-fashioned stoves and, and, and lamps and uh, radios and so on and they can explore what all the children uh, have uh, um, experienced during the Nazi times um, the, the 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 exhibition ends um, with a moment of reflection then we see the uh, children as they are nowadays and um, on, a, uh, on a large display, interactive display, they explain how the war still influences them until the day, until, yes. until today. Well, uh, it's, it's quite clear. It's for all of them. Uh, and uh, they also discuss what I think today's children can learn about uh, the experiences of war uh, and also about discrimination, democracy, rule of law. Um, and uh, the visitors can react, so they are encouraged to think about it as well. And uh, well, they, they, they most of the time uh, leave the Children's Museum, the Junior Museum, really impressed. And uh, yes, and the, or they often stay there for, for many hours, come back even, and uh, they are very impressed uh, by Eva's stories, but also especially by the story of the Nazi girl, because this is a story which is not much told. It's, it's still uh, a little taboo to talk mm. about it. And um, so it's, it's uh, very successful. 
That's so interesting. Thank you, Liz. But I'm I'm really hoping that eventually when we return to some kind of normality that we're we're able to do an exchange visit so that uh, we're able to see each other's exhibitions because there are so many um parallels in terms of our journey exhibition uh, for younger visitors and i think as you say that immersiveness but also those those four real stories in just really focusing on critical thinking and really exploring those choices it just it looks absolutely incredible yeah. thank you and and Eva I know that when we were speaking before we you were saying the the importance of sharing your story your testimony and the paintings through the museum and through you speaking to young people as well is particularly important to you and especially the paintings because of a promise that your father made earlier to you and to Heinz and I wondered if you could tell us about that promise that your father made. Yes um, well as I say Heinz was a very big so artistic he was a very very sensitive um, young man and um, when in 1942 no, 1944, um, after having been in hide, no, sorry, sorry. In 1942, when he got a call-up notice to be deported with many, many other young people to Germany to work in German factories, um, this was very suspicious for Jewish parents because in 1942, many German Jews had already been deported at taken to the concentration camps and, and ghettos and killed. So why should they invite more young people to come back into Germany? So when this um, notice came, my father said, Heinz, you are not going. We are going to go into hiding. The same was with Anne Frank's older sister, Margot, 16 years old, like Heinz, 16 years old. She got that call up notice and many, many of their friends so my father said, no, we are not going to send you. We are going to go into hiding. Well, you know, I didn't know hiding. Adults don't go hiding. I said to my father, what do you mean by hiding? And my father explained, I found some very wonderful people, Dutch people working for the resistance who will offer their homes for us to stay with them to keep us safe, but I couldn't find a family who could take in four people. So we have to split up. And um, so Heinz will go with him and I will go with my mother. And I was 13 years old and I started to cry. I said, I don't want to be separated. I love my brother very, very much and my father. And my father explained if we're in two different places, the chance that two of us will survive is bigger. Survive. So that was, I think, the first time that I realized it might be a matter of life and death. And I think the same for Heinz. He realized he might be killed. And being so sensitive, um, he had thought very much about death and dying. So he said, Papi, I'm afraid of dying. And my father said, well, unfortunately, this is how life is. Everybody has to die. Um, but it's not the end. Because if you have children, you will live on in your children. And then I said, but what if I die before I have any children? And my father was thinking for a moment and he said, even if you die in a young age, you have achieved something and somebody will remember. So you will never be completely forgotten. We are all in a chain and a link in a chain which goes from generation to generation and nothing is lost. So he had to accept that. And... Um, and that is true, you know. Um, yes, your, your body goes, 
what you have done is still with somebody, with your family. That's why so many people research now their, their, um, their ancestry. They want to know what their grandfather, great grandfather have done. And so it's, it's nothing is lost. And so when I have the paintings and they're in a museum and many, many people can see it, um, I feel I have kept the promise from my father to Hans that he will not be forgotten. And I've got a book written about that. It's, a, it's a, quite a little book for young people. It's called The Promise. It's a penguin book. And um, yeah, and that it was for me as well. When I was in the camp, I thought if I die with 15 years old, I was... I hadn't done any painting, I'd done any poetry, I was a very naughty, um, simple child, you know. Um, I will be forgotten. And so I really spent every minute of the day in the camp not to give up. I became very, very strong, I became um, fanatic, I have to, su have to survive. And yes, I did. And of course, I remembered the promise to my father, um, to Hans, and I wrote the book and I donated the paintings. And now I'm actually working on an animation film with an American filmmaker. Um, oh, so Good this is because this is very popular now, animation films. And um, I hope next year it will be finished. And um, I hope it will bring as well his life back to be remembered. Absolutely. And and like you say, Eva, for sharing with younger learners, just a, a really important way of, of reaching them using animation as well. That that sounds incredible. And I think we have the just the text um, of the promise. Um, and like you say, Eva, just so important in, in thinking about the paintings and the way now that you have shared the paintings. Um, and if I, if I just read um, the words of your father, so it says, children, I promise you this, everything you do leaves something behind. Nothing gets lost. All the good you have accomplished will continue in the lives of the people you have touched. It will make a difference to someone, somewhere, sometime, and your achievements will be carried on. Everything is connected, like a chain that cannot be broken. Just such powerful words. Eva. That's right, that's right, yes. And it can really comfort um, well, children and even adults, anybody. Absolutely. And, and Lisbeth, for your work, obviously, at the museum, that is part of the, the fulfilment, obviously, of that promise and a, a huge responsibility, I imagine, actually, that you feel as, as part of that work as well. And I think it would be really interesting to know a little bit about the way that that work impacts on the children that you work with and their families. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, as I told, uh, uh, we get a lot of ch school children, but also a lot of families. And because the uh, Junior Museum is not childish at all, it's it's also very interesting for the moms and dads and the grand grandfathers and, and grandmothers and they go into it and, and discuss the topics together about what's right and wrong, looking away, helping um, and, and, and it really inspires them. And also the paintings are a are, are, are very important part uh, because the children uh, can see that that Heinz uh, expressed his loneliness and his longing for freedom in the paintings, and they understand what it what it is to be in hiding because that's that's told in the in the in the story of Eva, and uh, Eva's character uh, tells 
in the in the part about the deportation train that Heinz told her that uh, the uh, the paintings were hidden under the floor of their uh, hiding address. And uh, when the children later on see the paintings and, and realize that they are real, it really makes, uh, uh, it has a, a, big, a, a big impact. They are really emotional about it. And uh, they are also uh, very grateful to, to Eva uh, that she uh, donated uh, the pictures so that uh, all of the children uh, can can see them and, and learn from them. So they often express, uh, we are so grateful that uh, Eva and also the other main characters donated these uh, their, their, their objects and their artifacts and their documents and also their stories to the museum. Because like you say, Elizabeth, there's something so tangible, isn't there? And, and so um, special to the students in that way. Um, yeah. And I think we can see um, a few photographs of um, a, a new way that you have started to share uh, Eva's story with students as well. I don't know if you want to say a little about that. Yes, yes. Uh, because there are now some some children don't go to museums uh, in the city center of Amsterdam, so that's why we started uh, the Dutch Resistance Junior Museum on Wheels in uh, 2018, and it's in a big trailer, and uh, we compressed the story in well, it, 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 uh, it, uh, it's 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 really well done. We express uh, compress the story, and uh, in the junior on reels, we we tell the same story as in the big museum, and uh, children say stay there for for many hours, and it travels all through the country, uh, especially in. Uh, uh, well, the 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 the, the, the uh, also the parts of Amsterdam uh, far out far out of the city with a lot of immigrants and um, it's it's really successful. Yeah, and just making sure that you really reach, like you say, lots of students in yeah. different communities. And Eva, yeah. again, it was it was you who first spoke to us um about the uh the outreach and about using the uh resistance museum on wheels and i think you were just really impressed with the way that the museum was taking the exhibition to children yes it's amazing um, i was supposed to come but i was just filming in austria at the time so i couldn't really be there but as soon as um we can travel again. I'm going to come back to Amsterdam and go on a little tour with a bus that I've promised myself. <clears throat> that I, I think the world, when Elizabeth is talking about uh, children being really grateful, Eva, I think there will be some incredibly grateful children when, uh, when you take the tour with the bus. And I, I think um, there will be some really special experiences there. Fingers crossed that it, it won't be too long before we're, we're able to, to think about some travel again, um, very much. <laughs> and you know, it is so nice um, um, in, the, in the house, the, it's translated into English, and there was a young girl who, um, was she English or was she Dutch, who, who spoke in English my story. And I mean, that is many years ago, Lisbeth, now. Mm -hmm. And she still kissed me, she still write me always a card and oh, say yeah. how how important it was for her to do this yeah. um, voiceover for me. Yeah. They were the young, the young children who do, who yeah. do voices. They were young actress uh, and we took children with the right accent. So this, yeah. uh, this <laughs> girls, nice. the girls nice, yeah. that are the voices of, of Eva have a German accent, like she has now. <laughs> <laughs> That's lovely. Yeah. Oh, it's so still, obviously still, you, do you don't lose accent. your accent ever, no. really. <laughs> no. <laughs> Yeah, that's that is a lovely story, Eva. And like you say, it, it obviously made a real impression on her. Um, 
So thank you, Elizabeth. Like, I, like, I, I'm, I'm like Eva. I can't wait to be able to travel, hopefully, to, to come and see it in person. So, um, and, and Eva, I know that obviously every year you, you share your testimony with thousands of students and learners and adult audiences. Um, I think we've got a photograph of you sharing your testimony with us um, at Bet Shalom um, at the centre. Um, and obviously, ordinarily, you would share your full testimony um, as far as far as you can in in, in shorter times uh, periods of time. And this evening, obviously, we've concentrated on a different aspect, really, because we've been looking at, at Heinz's paintings. And I know that that means that you won't share your testimony with us in full this evening. So we um, looked obviously just at a few aspects of your experiences to talk about a little bit this evening. And I think one of the, the first aspects of your story, your testimony, which is so important, is the importance of your family and the love and support of your family and I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about that. Um, well, from after the war. Um, well, yeah. or, or to, to start with Eva, if you didn't mind, if you could tell us a little bit before the war to start off with, that, that would be lovely. Thank you. Yes, well, in Austria, we were a very, very close family um, with many cousins and, and grandparents. And, um, and Austria is a beautiful country uh, with lakes and mountains. And my father and me were the sporty ones. And we always did excursions in the mountains. And, um, you know, I was a daredevil. It was really my mother and Heinz were more staying at home and were more careful and so on. But, you know, it was all... Uh, you know, I have not only lost, lost many family members, I lost as well my country because, mm -hmm. you know, my family was Austrian since for generations and that is in your blood. And um, it was very, very hard for me to leave Austria. Then we emigrated first to Belgium and um, they didn't like Jewish refugees. In Holland it was a bit better. They were actually very welcoming. Holland is quite a different type of country, very open, has through centuries always taken in refugees. Uh, but again, the Nazis became there only in um, February 1940, and in May the Nazis invaded already. So I didn't really have much freedom. So and then two years in hiding, um, cut off from the world and everything, cut off from writing to you know, people abroad. My grandparents who were in England didn't know what has happened to us. Um, you know, it was a very, very difficult time, all, all my youth really. And eventually then Auschwitz, of course, and eventually we came back again and um, life had to go on. And this was, um, it might sound peculiar, but I thought to start to make a life in a new country without my family, my father and my brother, I think that was even harder than Auschwitz. Because in Auschwitz I had always hope. But afterwards, I had no hope that I would ever see them again. This, um, you want to show a few pictures. This is Heinz. As I say, he was so musical. He had a guitar, he had an um, accordion, he had, we had a piano, he had a Hawaii guitar, he could play any instrument. If he heard a tune somewhere, he could play it. He didn't need music. And um, he, in, when we, when in Holland, before we went into hiding, the film Snow White and the Seven Dwarf came out. And in school, everybody spoke about that, but Jewish children were not allowed to go to the cinema. And so Heinz did on the blackout, which was big boards on the windows, he painted the dwarfs and Snow White. 
and he played the songs and I was dancing and he said, you see, you have your own personal performance. He was so thoughtful, you know, little things um, yeah. life more acceptable for me. It was really amazing. So after the war, um, I missed them so terribly much. And, um, and it was in Holland that we were together for the last and I didn't really want to stay in Holland. Um, and so, um, and now I must tell a little bit about Otto Frank. He was a neighbor and he knew, of course, our family. And he came to tell us one day that his whole family was perished. And my mother told him that she lost as well her husband and some. So they were very important to each other. They helped each other. Um, my mother cooked, invited Otto for meals and so on. And I was so full of hatred. And Otto said, you, should, you know, you will be a miserable person. And I said, well, don't you hate? He said, no. And that was for me a really revelation. I said, but you lost the Nazis killed so your whole family. How can you not hate them? And he said, I am a German. My family has lived in Germany for generation and I love their music, I love their literature, I love the language. How can I hate something which is really me? And he said, if you hate, you will live a miserable life. The people you hate, you don't, they don't know that you hate them. So eventually I started to get over my hatred. But this was for me, I think, the most difficult time of my life. Yes, absolutely, Eva. And in, in a way, does it, did it feel a, 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 a really helpful um, kind of way of looking at things for you, Eva? A, a bit of a turning point, maybe, in a way, the way that Otto spoke about that, was it? Yes, he was really a great help for me and for my mother. And, you know, both were actually lonely. And so they became very good friends. And eventually they got married and were married for 27 years. And I must say, I've never seen a happier marriage than those two people. Both had lost their first family, but they made a new life with their new family. Um, I was very unhappy in Holland and um, when I finished school, Otto got me a job in London as a photographer, an apprentice. And he gave me his special camera. He said, I'm not going to take no family anymore. I'm never going to take pictures. He gave me his Leica, which I started to be a photographer with the Leica. This picture you see there of my mother and, and Otto was taken with the Leica by me. Oh, goodness. Yeah. It's a, it's a beautiful picture, Eva. Yeah. But when I got to England, um, I met a young man um, who had come from Israel to study economics. And we became sort of friends. We both didn't have any money. We went for long walks. And after six months, he said to me, Eva, I fall in love with you. Will you marry me? And when I'm finished with my studies, we can start a new life and go back to Israel. And I said, no, thank you. And he was quite shocked. Why not? Because, you know, we both didn't tell each other who we were. I said I was Dutch, which I wasn't. He said he was Israeli, which he wasn't. He was a German refugee. We didn't speak of the past, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, he was a bit sad. But then Otto, who kept an eye on me, came to England. And um, I told him this young man has asked me to marry him. But of course, I won't. And um, because I will go back to my mother, I was very, very close with my mother, as you can imagine. Yes. And um, so, um, and then he said to me, you know, your mother and me have fallen in love as well. And once you are married, we like to get married. So I went back to this young man and said, well, you can marry me now, <laughs> which we did. And we went... Um, 
It's end of the year. We went to Amsterdam, got married in Amsterdam because we didn't know anybody here. Yeah. And, um, yeah. And we were married for 63 years. And um, we had three daughters and Otto and my mother had a family again. Otto was the best grandfather you can imagine. So, you know, even his life was actually very happy again in the end. Of course, you never forget your first family, but, you know, we still had actually a very good life. But nevertheless, all this, what I had experienced was in my brain. I never talked about it. I didn't talk to my children, not to my husband about it. The first time I spoke was in 1986. After 40 years, I started to open up and then I could let go. So again, one of the advices I give to kids, if they have a problem, please, please talk about it. Because as soon as you share it with somebody, um, you might not get rid of the problem, but to share it, to bring it in the open, is a great, great help. And um, an Anna Frank exhibition came to, to England in 1986 for the first time, and I was invited, of course. And I was not a speaker, I was a very shy person. And it was Ken Livingston uh, who opened it, and he said at the end, and now Eva will tell you something. Well, I didn't want to tell anything. I was very shy, I'd never spoken, certainly not into a crowd, but I stood on this podium and everything I had suppressed came flooding out and they could stop me. And that was for me really a watershed. That was a very important moment. And then they asked me always to open the exhibition, which I did. And um, that's how I became a public speaker. And so from 19, um, and then I wrote my first book, Eva's Story. And um, yes, and then I was asked everywhere to come and speak and tell my story, which I did first, not so easily, but I learned to do it. And my last years really now, for 20 years, I've been traveling the world. I've been in Australia, I've been in China, I've been in Japan, um, a lot in America, of course. And everybody should know and learn about the atrocities that have happened. Because only through knowing can you not repeat the same thing. Absolutely. And I think, like you say, Eva, just the absolute importance of Holocaust education, that you so show so much, obviously, dedication and commitment in sharing your testimony with young people. And I think particularly as we come to Holocaust Memorial Day, it's so much incumbent on everybody to, to make sure that obviously those testimonies and your story is being shared. And um, it's interesting, Eva, like you say, to, to go to so many different countries to, to share your testimony with people. And I imagine it, it feels quite strange at the moment, actually not traveling. And I know that you are just as busy sharing your testimony, but I, I, I imagine it feels quite different be, being at home. Well, it's different, you know, to speak in front of a big crowd. In mm. America, I speak usually to 2,000 people. So they have just huge uh, halls and things. Mm. And now, you know, to be at the moment, I see three, four people. But I hope it's going to go around the world as well, because people have to learn. The young people have to know what is happening, because unfortunately, we don't live yet in a good world. There is terrible racism, there's terrible prejudice, there's refugee problems. We have a lot of things to sort out to make an equal, good world for everybody. I hope President Biden, he does mention all those things as well, that it should be a, a better world for everybody, not just for a few people. 
absolutely and like you say Eva it's such an important message and I know it feels strange obviously not being able to see like you say um the audience in the way that you would do ordinarily when when you are speaking um and just before we um come to a close this evening I just wanted to share with you um, a few of the comments that people have been sending in from the audience this evening. Um, so Emma says, thank you for speaking, Eva. You are a true inspiration. And then we have a comment from Susan Kerner, who says, Eva, you look and sound wonderful. Um, I know that Lisbeth and I said this evening how, how wonderful you looked, uh, Eva, and Susan obviously agrees. Thank you, Susan and Emma. Um, and then we've also got a comment. Uh, Susan says, I hope to visit the Dutch Resistant Museum and see the outreach bus. That's such a good idea. So hopefully, Lisbeth, when we do eventually um, have the ability to travel again, you might find that you have some additional visitors uh, I think from this evening um, and I'm just going to finish uh, with a question um, Eva if that's okay just for the last few minutes um, that has come to us from Brogan um, and the question says I have read your books and been very moved by your story and by your brother's paintings what message would you give to any young people watching tonight? To any new, what message would you give to any young people watching tonight? What advice? What message? What message? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, that's uh, difficult to just give one message. Um, well, enjoy what you have got. Um, try to be happy. Try to help people. Um, and you know, you have one life in earth, on earth, make the most of it. And if you have a difficult period now, I know it's very difficult for young people to be cooped up, but there is a light, it's not forever. And while you are cooped up, you can do many, many things. Draw, write something. Um, you know, there's so many things you can do when you are stuck at home as well. So um, don't give up. Um, and, and, you know, everything passes. Eva, I think that is, that is such important and, and helpful advice for young people. Thank you so much. And I just wonder if we could just um, re-show the picture of the clock where we're able to see the little bird, um, just to, obviously, as we're thinking about Eva's advice for young people to take the time in this really difficult situation um, that we're in, like you say, Eva, to try to do something creative and like you say, to, to try to make a difference and to be kind, um, I think is a really important message for young people to take away from this evening. So I would just um, like to finish by just saying thank you so much, obviously, to both of you for joining us this evening. Obviously, in looking at the idea of sharing the light in the darkness, it's just been such a privilege to be able to talk about Heinz's paintings and the work of the museum, Lisbeth, in, in sharing your really important story, Eva. But I think as well, it, it comes across so clearly, Eva, the way that you are sharing hope and very much sharing that example of being the light in the darkness. So thank you so much. We've been so privileged to have both of you join us this evening. Thank you, Lisbeth, for joining us this evening. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank and, you, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, you uh, for coming along from Holland as well. <laughs> I know you are not here, but joining us. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, mm -hmm. and Eva, thank you so, so much to you for sharing some of the really rich stories behind, obviously, the paintings and for sharing just some parts of your experiences with us as well and just 
leaving us obviously with that message to think about in the way that we're able to consider being the light in the darkness. And we're so grateful to you for joining us this evening, Eva. Thank you so much. Thank you, Louise. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you so much for everybody who has watched us at home as well. Uh, please keep an eye on our website, obviously, for the other live events that we're going to be sharing over the next week. And thank you so much for joining us this evening. We look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you.